Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Welcome to Constitutional Chats, Constituting America's Constitutional Chats. We're thrilled you're with us today. My name is Janine Turner. Come on in. I'm the founder and co-president of Constituting America. We're thrilled you're with us today. We have a great, great guest. We're so excited. We have the extraordinary T Tammy Bruce with us today. And we're going to be talking about the 19th Amendment. And our topic is, what if you couldn't vote? which is exactly the way it was for women all those years until 1920, 1919, 1920. But my name is Janine Turner. I'm an actress by trade. You can find out all that at JanineTurner.com. But as I said, I'm the founder and co-president of Constituting America. We're thrilled you're with us. Kathy Gillespie is co-president of Constituting America. And we like to say an eagle needs two wings to fly. And so Kathy's one and I'm another and all everyone on this panel are the wind beneath the wings of Constituting America as well as our donors. Oh, let me, in case you don't know about Kathy, Kathy was a CEO on the Hill for a decade. She's so incredibly brilliant. And she's also now one of the few special, I think 16 people chosen to be on the Sima Quincentennial Commission, the 250th anniversary of our nation's founding. Kathy Gillespie, you're on. Well, thank you, Janine, and thank you for all you do to lead Constituting America. We're really blessed to, to have your leadership. I want to thank our sponsor today, Mr. Jerry Kohler of New Mexico. Jerry is part of our regular uh, Constitu Constitutional Chats audience. He's on almost all our chats, and Jerry, we're really appreciative of you sponsoring this episode of Constitutional Chats today. We invite everyone else out in the audience who's listening to consider uh, being a sponsor as well, and you can find out more information on our website. So thank you, Jerry. Yes, thank you, Jerry. <laughs> All right, I'm going to briefly introduce Tova Love Kaplan, who is extraordinary. We've known Tova, I guess, since she's 17 now, since she or she was 12 or so. Um, she's one of the most extraordinary young women that I know, if not the, and it's saying a lot because I have a daughter, Tova. <laughs> but Tova is a three-time winner of our We the Future contest. She won for entrepreneurial in the entrepreneurial category when she was 12. She's won best PSA and now best app. So she's a right brain, left brain thinker. She's a national youth director of Constituting America, which she runs like a CEO of a top 100 company. And um, she wants to maybe secretary of state someday that I, you know, the president, the, the president of the UN. Tova Love Kaplan, welcome. Say a few words of hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're always so glad to have you here. I can't believe it's going to be like coming up on a year since we started doing this. I know we have over 50 episodes, so it's just amazing to me that we've been able to provide this content for people. And thank you to our sponsors who made it possible. Um, and I'm glad to see that there's some kids on today. So hope you enjoy the content and feel free to ask questions because we love your input. Okay, drum roll, please. As we said, it's the uh, the nineteenth amendment today, and our topic is what if you couldn't vote? Well, women couldn't vote for a very long time, and Miss Tammy Bruce has a lot of interesting, fun facts to talk about in regard to this. But let me tell you about our special guest. If you don't know her already, because she's a superstar, uh, today's guest, our guest is Tammy Bruce, president of Independent Women's Voice. Um, she is also an independent conservative, a political analyst, New York Times best-selling author. I always wanted to be one of those. Fox News political contributor, radio talk show host, and columnist at the Washington Times and foxnews.com. A free speech and Second Amendment advocate, an important contributor to her position, an important contributor to her position on the issue comes from her experience as a radio talk show host. The Tammy Bruce Show, which I remember, Tammy, you were on the cover of all these magazines when I had my radio show, premiered in 1993 in Los Angeles. It was nationally syndicated in 2005. 
and enjoying over 200 terrestrial affiliates. It's a lot. In 2009, in a move to gain more freedom, Ms. Bruce took her radio show Independent, making it an exclusive new media program available online and via podcast. Very smart and ahead of your time, Tammy, to do that. Tammy Radio has enjoyed being consistently in the top one, top 10 programs through the worldwide internet radio hub, TalkStream Live. Additionally, Ms. Bruce has been profiled and her editorials and co commentaries on significant social issues, which have been published nationally and internationally in a wide variety of magazines, newspapers, including the New York Times, that's amazing, the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, the San Francisco Chronicle, Esquire, and The Advocate, among others. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm applause for Miss Tammy Bruce. Tammy Bruce, welcome to the show. It's a thrill to be here uh, with my schedule also, uh, our being able to do this virtually. And I think for a lot of people watching, it, you know, it might normally it would not have been possible for us to get together. So this is very exciting. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, uh, all of you do great work. That's why I was thrilled when I was asked. Uh, and of course, especially uh, about with, with the work of your organization, what's imperative is reminding people of its importance, learning about it, because we, of course, we have a, a problem with basic education in this country when it comes to public schools and what they teach. And I remember social studies, which now uh, is not taught for the most part, um, uh, history. Uh, is uh, not taught. So this is uh, imperative and it's great to know that so many parents and kids uh, and uh, students are watching. So thank you for having me. One of the things that I, I love about what the founders did uh, and about the constitution is that it is written in a fashion intended to be interpreted and intended to be able to, as a result, uh, live with a country that they anticipated growing and changing. And of course, we have the amendments, uh, and yet they made it very difficult to change the document for a very good reason, which is to make sure, and it's the same about, it's the same in Congress for the most part. Uh, people get frustrated when things go slowly, but the founders wanted things to go slowly because of the heat of the moment. They didn't want things to happen uh, without people really being thoughtful about it. And so a good example of that is prohibition. Uh, the 18th Amendment, which I, I'm sure you've covered already, um, uh, was was something that, you know, I guess on the surface sounded good. And look, alcohol, even today, uh, lends itself to a lot of problems in people's lives, lends itself to domestic violence, uh, to to the, the ruination of lives. And the idea is, well, if we get rid of it, uh, that'll change everything. And of course, we found that the opposite was true. In fact, people uh, made their own booze. If you had enough money, you were able to, to get alcohol. Uh, you were able to go to speakeasies. Uh, but it, it became more of a law for uh, the poor against the poor, if you will. Uh, and that is what morality legislation tends to do, is it is people with money and access tend to be able to get what they want no matter what. And people uh, on the lower end of the spectrum, socially, economically, uh, are subjected uh, to those laws and don't have uh, a way around it. So we found during the depression that uh, it, we needed to repeal it because we, the economy was going down, uh, uh, lives were being still ruined uh, with moonshine, people were dying and we saw the hypocrisy involved. And so we, we did, we went back and, and repealed it. And that's the exciting thing. When it comes to the 19th Amendment, something a very different process occurred. And this is what I think the founders intended was it, it was for decades, the argument was that women should be able to vote. Uh, even in the 1700s, around the time of the revolution, just after the revolution, uh, we started, New York in particular started property reformation for women. There is a recognition that as you know, men were fighting in you know, the, the war for the Revolutionary War, that you couldn't have women without the ability to act on property as an example. So there were slow, small steps, but there were reformation aspects when it came to the role of women uh, in, uh, as owners of property, in uh, handling money, because we were considered effectively property. Right, women were not able to take a job. We weren't able to own a piece of property. We were not able to take 
uh, 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 inheritances. Um, and it's, it's like, that's why in Downton Abbey, everybody was always worried about the, the woman getting married because she could not inherit uh, anything from the family estate. So in uh, the uh, uh, states, you know, as we were in the war, there was a recognition that women and women advocated for this. It was, you know, how can we live our lives without being in charge of our lives? And, and that was very important. So in the 1800s I and mean, for decades prior, uh, there was agitation uh, for the vote. Uh, it was recognized as the country got bigger uh, after the Civil War that women and with the Civil War going on and such upheaval, you know, there was no reason uh, to have uh, the half the talent in this country, half of its uh, citizens not be able to participate. So that was really kind of the slow time argument, right? And it was, it, it persuaded people in the process. Uh, there was all kinds of action that was used in the process. And then we finally got to the point uh, in the 20th century uh, where, it, where it was possible and where it worked. Part of that argument, and I say this to, to all the students watching and all the parents, is that while we think of this as being uh, exclusively an, you know, an important uh, government action, which it was, of course, it was the social action and the interactions between um, husbands and wives, parents and their children, uh, the generations coming after when, when the women who were fighting in 1870 and 1880 for this talking to their children, showing them, telling them what mattered, and that generation carrying it forward, and the next generation doing so as well. And that's important, but it involved also not just women and their daughters, but it involved their husbands and their brothers and their fathers, uh, their best friends, and moving this along. So you have, of course, a Congress uh, that was all men uh, voting for the 19th Amendment. So it was men giving up effectively their power. And that's what having the complete vote was, was having complete and total power. So it was men giving up that power, uh, but it was men of course being influenced. When we think about what if you couldn't vote, the women up to that point could not vote uh, per se, but they could um, have conversations uh, with the men in their lives who held the power. And that is true to this day for, for all of us. If you're too young to vote, uh, if you're in a, a position where you wonder what your voice can mean and if you can have any impact, we still have that reality, we still have that right. And uh, certainly uh, having the vote is imperative, but the persuasion that happens with our voices uh, is key because men still do have the majority of power in government uh, and men still care about the women in their lives. And that is how, of course, uh, this ultimately uh, worked out. And uh, so it's, it's uh, you know, here we are in the 21st century uh, and it's, we, we live in a dynamic country with a brilliant, I believe divinely inspired, if well, inspired at the very least document and founding of a country that expects us to have these conversations, expects us to make sure that, that you as students, as the next generation, that what you think, uh, making sure you hear all kinds of arguments keeping an open mind and realizing the value of who you are and what your intentions are matters, but also realizing uh, that as most of us who are now out of school realize that your opinions can change, that keeping this open mind, realizing that uh, you know people you admire have a certain kind of opinion uh, and uh, you will then, I, I consider it like a toolbox. You get all kinds of information for your toolbox and then freely coming to an opinion about, about what's best. And I think that's what's uh, led us uh, here to uh, the 19th Amendment. And even like with a prohibition and the 18th Amendment, having the ability and the courage uh, to say you're wrong and to reverse yourself. And we've been able to do that too. But with the 19th Amendment, because of the ex extended experience of getting it passed and uh, the, the, the generally universal embracement of it, the realization it was important, uh, as especially after World War I, was uh, the, as the fact that it's lasted, it is short, uh, it is meaningful, uh, and America agreed. And it's a beautiful, exciting thing. So it's a pleasure to be here to talk about it.
Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Tammy. There's so many things are popping in my mind as, as you're, as you're discussing this. One of, one of which is how long it took. I mean, you know, the evolution um, in the, what, 1776, Abigail Adams was saying, remember the ladies and John Adams, who I think is wonderful. Uh, one of my favorite founding fathers, like whatever. <laughs> you know? He was like, sure, sure. Abigail will remember the ladies. And yet Abigail Adams was, was such an influence over John, you know, she was, and that's, right. that's really, really true. Behind every man is a woman, so to speak, it's, it's the power that women still manage to have. And what I also find astonishing, and I, I've even been trying to explain to my daughter, who's now 23 years old, what it was like to be in Hollywood as a 17 year old in 1979 or 1980, you know, uh, that, that what it was like to, what it was like as a woman to step into that world and it's, it's incomprehensible for her, which, you know, what, it's, what it was like to, to try to exist in a way where you weren't demeaned or put in a bathing suit and, and working your way up for respect, even into the 1990s, even when I was on a hit show, you know, and so it, it's good that it's hard for them to understand that because it means we've made a lot of progress. But it's, it's, um, I, I just think about the continuing stair step evolution that we all have, have been making and it's, uh, really astonishing that it's taken it took as long as it did but that's as you say the our founding fathers didn't want it to be didn't want it to be a fast process and lastly i'll talk about it maybe i'll, I'll the, the, the issue we're having with dialogue today um i'm reading a lot of books right now i'm reading about six books at once <laughs> but this um this this situation that we're in where only one point of view matters and that there can be no open dialogue we, we wouldn't have progressed as a nation ironically without the dialogue and now people think well you can't have the dialogue or we won't progress as a nation what are your thoughts about that because i think the thing is it's my way and this is the way it has to be or you know and so that we can progress but that's not really how an exchange of ideas or the growth of the country or amend the amendment process any of that is supposed to happen what are your well, thoughts it's on not, that yeah it's what it's what made uh, and makes this country the greatest on earth is the premise and the founders knew this. What's happening now is not unique. Uh, it's not just an American thing, certainly, but the founders and the, the first amendments, right? Uh, the the uh, first and the second and the third, the, the founders understood coming from the old world what the what the threats were. It was about the human condition. It was the desire of power to keep you from being able to meet. So that's the First Amendment. These were prohibitions to government. They were statements to government about what you don't dare touch. You don't dare touch anything because we're the sovereign. And that was, of course, flipping the world on its head. Normally, it was, the, of course, the monarch who was the sovereign. In the United States, the people were the sovereign, which means we were granted every single right uh, it, that, that was uh, godly and humanly possible. And, and that was bestowed mm -hmm. upon us, not upon the leaders. So the government does not give us anything. We give the government the power to take action and uh, to have certain powers. So the founders understood that being able to meet, free expression, being able to speak your mind about the issues, also being able to have a firearm, being able to uh, uh, worship uh, as however you want it, these are the first amendments because it, those are the things that were used to crush a people that prohibiting those things were necessary to keep people down and it is why people fled the old world because they were they wanted to have their faith um you have the mayflower you know those people coming over it's like enough of this we want to be able to just live our lives and that is the seed and they knew also that in order to be free from a government that might be tyrannical, um, you needed to be able to have conversations. It was imperative that you had debate. It was imperative that the government not be allowed to stop you from being able to have those conversations. Uh, any sort of whether going to church and praying or being able to meet in, with a group that maybe the government doesn't approve of, uh, or, uh, whatever it is, that that those are the actions they take that they knew would crush us and here we are um and it may not be government regulations but now you have non-governmental entities 
that whether it's the tech industry, uh, entities that control the town square and the conversations we have, social media, et cetera, they're doing it instead. And I think, uh, Janine, this is our challenge now is realizing that while big tech might not be government, government is involved with big tech. Someone who is a, a pretty high up person in Facebook just left Facebook to go be in Joe Biden's administration. We know there's a revolving door between government and media. We know now there's a revolving door between big tech and government. And so we now have to look at the reality of how our speech is being closed, uh, be, using political correctness, the cancel culture, uh, issues of intimidation and pressure uh, to stop us from being able to have our conversations. The founders did not anticipate this environment, but they, they knew with the human condition that it would occur again. And now it's up to us uh, to be able to find a solution to this. It is unacceptable. It, we will not surrender to it. And, and yet it's going to take work and it will have to involve government in the solution, uh, but it's a new age. And what we're dealing with here is a section of, well, it's not even political theory. Uh, it is again, the human condition through the last century it's individuals who know that they can't persuade you through a conversation. So they want you to retreat. They want you to zip it. They want you to be silent because they can't, they don't want anybody else to hear your argument because your argument might be uh, interesting and intriguing and important and persuasive. And that's the only reason to, to shut people up. I get excited with having conversations with people because I'm confident in what I think and why I think it. And a confidence, when I speak at colleges, uh, young people, this is just before things got very, very ugly at colleges and no one could speak. But um, uh, without exception at most colleges, someone would come up to me and say, how do you get your ideas? You know, what is it, why are you so confident? And, and what's the process? And I'll say to, to our viewership right now and, and to the young people who rely on you, is that nobody taps you on the shoulder and gives you permission. It's your decision. You decide that what I think matters and that I'm gonna get as much information as I can. I'm gonna own my position. I'm gonna be able to argue it. It's gonna be able to withstand a debate, uh, but it is, don't ever wait for anyone to say, uh, you now can take the torch. Those who've changed the world have decided on their own that what they think matters, but they must be able to defend their positions uh, within the public sphere. Right now, we've got people who are never pressed and that creates problems because sometimes their ideas are bad. Other people don't learn. I've learned over the years, you've learned over the years, all of you here with me today uh, about uh, what works with our ideas and what doesn't, but we must be challenged uh, and uh, then we can be even more confident with how we proceed. Very true, and I'm gonna. I want Tova to ask some questions in a second. Well, well said. And um, that we can't auto. We can't. We can't correct. You know, if, if if the wonderful thing about a dialogue is you can hear both points of view. You can reason. What we've lost here is the ability to reason. And you can only reason if you hear two two points of view. Great point. And if 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 you have a movement, and you can't talk about it. And I, this book company was also saying you need to go even when you don't agree so you can challenge that person, have a dialogue with that person, maybe learn a little bit from the person. Right. But, you, but, but every movement needs to be able to correct, to, to, to fine tune. And if you're not open and to, to that, grow, that, to grow. Yes, yes, you grow and, and the idea gets better and better. And if it's just tyrannical, then that's where you're going to end anyway. Um, what is tyranny when, when no one can actually um, have a say in the situation, but also we we can't um, we can't kind of define ideas in a way. I always talk about the swing, right? I remember in the sixties it was save the dolphins, and my dad was a West Pointer and all this, and so you had the my family was very traditional, and then you had the save the dolphins, and and yet you know if they had to probably get a little over here in the swing, and then you bring it back to here in the middle, and you find a way to have you know better oceans, you know, without being completely radical about it. And I think that that's that's the beauty is coming together to find the common ground. And you can't find the common ground if we cannot both have a conversation. We actually go into schools and we have a program called Civil Civic, how to have a civil civic conversation. Right, And right. we're 
or bring big issues like um, uh, immigration or, or climate change. Um, Kathy knows a lot of the sub other subjects that we're doing as well. And we go in and we actually have these kids debate and learn to listen to the other point of view. The last thing I want to say to women, and I want Tova to ask her questions. Um, I've written a book holding her head high about 12 exceptional women spanning 17 centuries. And one of the women was, was of the 19th, so on the cusp of the, well, she was born in 1830 and, and died in 1913. She lived a very long time or later, later than that, like 1918, 19, 19. She, she died the year actually. And she, of course she was fighting. She was the first woman to actually run for president, Belva Lockwood and be on the ballot. Nobody knows right. about her. Um, but what was astonishing is I learned this as a woman and you touched on this is that women could not, they, they had no say with their children. They had, they were, the, the husband could say, I'm going to take our child and he's going to, or she's going to become a, a you know, a, a servant now I'm going to sell her. And uh, she's, she's, they, they, if they got a divorce, forget about it. If they got a divorce, they lost the children. They lost everything if they could even get a divorce. But um, it was really astonishing. Women could, women a lot of times did not want to remarry if they were widowed because if, when they were, when they were single, they could actually have property. But That's if right. they were married, they could have property. So being a married woman uh, was really tricky. Can you imagine raising your children let and me, not having to update have that? that. It, I've got to get that book of yours because I don't have it and it sounds great. But I can update that to what surprises some people in my, my second book called The Death of Right and Wrong is that there's a series of things that people don't realize, especially uh, the young women here watching. It wasn't until the 1970s, and you were busy working, I was busy working uh, as young women, where we could not apply for our own credit card. We would mm -hmm. have had to have had the signature of a male guardian or relative. Um, mm -hmm. Up until I think also the 70s, um, and maybe even to the 80s, but women were not allowed to ride, to fly on the shuttle airplanes between New York and Washington, DC. Girls were not allowed to be pages in Congress as recently as the seventies or eighties. Um, you know, there's, and then a help wanted ads, you'll recall, were separated, a lot of people don't know this, by gender. There was the help wanted ads for men and the help wanted ads for women. And all of the assistant manager jobs and you know, the higher paying jobs for the executives or the assistant to the executive were on the, for the men. For women, it was waitress and secretary. And mm -hmm. those, you couldn't apply for the, the jobs. And this, I remember as a, a young girl, uh, as my mother was looking for work in the 70s under Carter and everybody was unemployed, she kept looking at, the, and she didn't want to be a waitress. I, eventually she ended up working in retail but I kept pointing to the jobs about being like the manager of a store. And she says, I can't apply for that. That's for a man. And this is in my lifetime. And mm -hmm. it, that's important uh, to recognize that it's, it's more recent, uh, but women, and in one way or another, we will face these kinds of things. And that's why your book now uh, would, still would make a difference and remind people about what it is we've had to face. I want to read yours. Uh, what's the what's the title? Right, Death wrong, of right and wrong. What? I'll send it to you. I'll send oh. it to you. Okay, I'll send you mine. I'll send you okay. mine. Okay, great. Um, I, I, before I tell it to Tova, I'll just I'll just comment on that. My mother got a divorce. I was in Hollywood at night in 1979. Um, I'd been in New York City as a 15 year old Molly for a year, but now I was I was in Hollywood, and all of my auditions were bathing suits and sure, things of that of nature. Whereas um, I was engaged at the time and he was getting, he was an actor and he was getting all kinds of, you know, wonderful, wonderful roles. And I was just getting, you know, tossed around as being the woman that was always kidnapped and had to be rescued, you know, that type of thing. Right. But my mother had to get a, uh, she got it she was going through a divorce, very traumatizing. I, I think this was 1979 in about how to get a credit card. Could she get a credit card? Could she, you know, how was she going to get a job? It was Crazy. really, really traumatizing. Okay. Tova Love Kaplan. You are on. Thank you. And this is this is so interesting. I mean, so much of the stuff, even I didn't realize the extent of discrimination against women, which as you said before, that's a good thing. Thank God for the woman that came before me who, you know, paved the way and made it so that things like this things like that sound unimaginable today. Although there's of course still stuff left that we need to deal with, but it's really amazing. Um, 
And so I just had a bunch of questions that were kind of coming into my mind. Okay, so previously on the show, we studied the, um, I believe it was the 15th Amendment that gave Black men the right to vote. Um, and we talked about how, you know, obviously that that didn't just solve voting rights forever for African American men because kind of immediately after there were attempts to subvert that right by passing like, um, I forget what they're called, but like voter voter intimidation or you know legal the, codes. Jim Crow laws were yeah were a Jim primary Crow factor laws. in that yeah in the South. Yeah, and like literacy tests and things like that mm -hmm. to try to prevent the 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 right to vote um, for black men, but we don't really hear about that in regards to the right to vote for women. So immediately after the 19th amendment, were there any similar attempts to try to prevent women from voting either informally? Well, yes. There well, were? yes, but, uh, and this is a, a important aspect of this because there's a presumption that this meant all women. It certainly did not mean black women. Now for black women uh, in uh, the North, there, there could be some voting but we had the same dynamic in the South. It was Jim Crow laws, which um, uh, were named, Jim Crow, it was named after a minstrel character. Uh, it, and it, it created the racial segregation effectively, was that, you know, where you could sit, where if, if you could sit in a, you know, a, a train car or, a, you know, whatever that dynamic was, uh, the ability to work, um, to go to school, uh, et cetera. And that included, of course, the ability uh, to vote. So there was widespread intimidation, uh, keeping uh, black people, men and women. Uh, but the, 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 we have to remember the lauding of the 19th Amendment. Uh, still, you could uh, keep people from voting, as you've mentioned, in a variety of different fashions, uh, whether it be a poll tax where you had to pay to vote um, uh, or a, a yes, literacy tests. And those, of course, also uh, affected just really anybody. It was not widespread to have an education. Literacy was not a widespread thing. In the beginning, it was you had to own land, uh, which then, of course, separated out even the men, right? If you didn't own land, then you couldn't vote. Uh, and so there were always these kinds of categories that the establishment, which we still fight against uh, with all of our might, uh, the establishment is has always been determined and always, I would contend, always will be determined to limit the ability of the normals, as I call us, uh, from being able to have an influence. Um, uh, and uh, that's what we saw certainly with, with Black men. Again, if you, you, you had an exodus into the North as a result of this, and also you had uh, African Americans moving into the larger cities in the South that didn't have so much blatant efforts to stop uh, voting rights and education. Uh, but then there was the, uh, 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 a backlash to that as well. So uh, black men, uh, again, er had the right to vote earlier than women, but again, it was hit and miss about whether or not you could exercise that right. And the same for black women. Uh, and that's why there was, has been a very big argument about the issue of uh, race and sex, uh, but even if something, as I've mentioned, like prohibition, if the establishment, you can have all the laws you want and you can have you know, all kinds of requirements and amendments, if people don't like it and they've got money, they, they can subvert that. They can access what it is they wanna access. This, has got to, this is a community agreement when you have laws and when you have a constitution. So uh, for me, I think it comes down to, and for our history, as we look at the 19th Amendment, what it meant and what it did not mean for black women, uh, the effort and the impact of Jim Crow laws and segregation and direct intimidation to keep uh, women uh, from voting uh, in the South, uh, and then uh, uh, the efforts to come North uh, to be able to uh, have that experience, but there was still a clearly discrimination in the North as well. Um, so we have to remember that as distinct, um, discrete elements that the amendments are, they are templates appealing to the nature of human beings and are better angels or not. And that's where uh, Americans come in is that we're able to do so much and then we become, we become a better country. It's, this is an effort to constantly become a better country by becoming better people. But it's like practicing medicine. You, you, you literally practice at it each day because it changes each day and the challenges change. 
And uh, uh, it's Condoleezza Rice put it very well saying that we had kind of like a birth defect and that we're constantly working to become better people. And as a result, the nation's not gonna make us better people. We make the nation better. And that is why this fight continues. So true. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. It's a great point about how, you know, this didn't really extend to Black women. And, you know, we see even today, there's still massive voter suppression efforts, especially targeting the Black community and Black women. So it's a fight that still continues until today. I would say yes for them and frankly for all of us. Again, I see this as the establishment, this larger infrastructure of government, which is gigantic. And uh, it was also the establishment when it came to racial discrimination. The threat to the status quo is the thing that upsets um, uh, those who have enjoyed, look, power is nice. I want everybody to have power. I don't not like power. I don't not like money. I want everybody to have as much money as possible and have as much power and because that does give us ultimately freedom. The more of us that have money, the more we're able to make decisions about what we want to do. So we must beware that yes, it is about racial minorities, uh, but it is also about challenging a status quo, no matter who you are, for sure. Am I being too radical? No, that's great. Okay, I don't good. Think, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I don't think, um, you know, trying to improve voter participation is radical in any that's way. Right. That's great, um, benefits everyone. So I was also wondering, um, there's been a lot written today about the divide in voting patterns between women and men. Um, it's an established fact that women vote very differently than men, and that divide has been actually increasing a lot over the last, you know, few decades. And so I was wondering, in the immediate aftermath, once half the population suddenly became eligible to vote when they hadn't previously, mm -hmm. how did this change the politics? How did this change how politicians had to appeal to people? And how did it change the demographics of who was elected, both, both in terms of, you know, gender or representation, but also in terms of the policies they put forth and who they had to appeal to? Well, you know, a uh, great question. And I've, I've used a prohibition as an example here from the start. And I'll do that again, is that the, the worry, there was worry constantly about what women would do. Um, how would they vote, right? Because women are different from men. We do have different interests, but not inherently completely different interests, right? Our interests are our family for the most part. It could be a traditional family or an extended family, our community, the people we love. We instinctually obviously want our community to be better because then our, our family is safer, our property values go up. Um, and, and so we have very similar interests uh, as uh, the men in our lives, as our family uh, in general. But there was a, a, a big effort when there was this realization that prohibition wasn't working. That was the 18th amendment. Then we have to have the 19th. And it became a bit of a, of a fight because women still experienced and believed, uh, I think partly accurately, that alcohol contributed to so many problems in life. And, it, and the good news is, is that it, it meant that it was not as easy, it was even harder to get things going because you had a different category of people who had different life experiences, right? Um, that would look and would want different kinds of policies. And uh, if, if you thought they were wrong, you didn't wanna have to, it's like the tyrannical voices now. You didn't wanna have to answer to those people or persuade them. It's a problem of believing that you have sole possession of the truth. Whereas very often the truth is somewhere in, in the middle. Uh, and the, under, the ability to understand what someone else's life is, whether it is uh, the life of a Black American or of a woman or of a gay person, that we, we shouldn't presume that we can know, but we should presume that, in fact, that life experience is different in, in, in many contexts. So the, it was a longer, pro even though the, it was repealed, the 18th Amendment was repealed very quickly, um, uh, it still probably would have been even more quickly uh, repealed if women weren't part of that uh, effort uh, and feeling much more empowered. It began to get more steam and really kind of hit the home run when a couple of women who were involved uh, in the prohibition movement said, yes, we agree, this has been a problem, this has to change, this did not work. And that's 
that's where we come into this as well. Uh, and I, I think even, um, even now, I, we, what, when I was on the left, we talked a lot about the gender gap with the voting. People make the mistake of thinking that that is how many people vote, the difference between how many men vote versus how many women. The gender gap, um, as it was defined uh, and created at the time, actually spoke to the, the, the issue of in a household, whoever made the decision first about what or who to vote for, the spouse followed. So if a woman made the decision to vote for a candidate X or for proposition A, the husband would likely vote that way as well. If the husband made the decision first, this comes down into the private conversations in a household. If the husband made the decision first, that would impact the way the woman voted. So the effort became from the feminist movement to get women to decide quickly and to be the first ones to make a decision about how to move a social issue and what candidate mattered. Because that, was, that would create the gender gap. The gap was the decision making. But that would go both ways. It wasn't just about women deciding and being influential in the household. It was the team of this family that would operate. Uh, and it works also now as we're learning, obviously with gay marriage, that who, whichever partner decides, the other partner would likely vote with them. So uh, I think that it, came, it influenced what the feminist movement tried to do when it came to influencing women. And I think very often the corners were cut. Uh, women were misled in many ways, uh, manipulated uh, in many ways in order to get them to take stands on issues. Uh, and that as a result, men, they would have less of, they'd make less of an effort to convince men, the, the organizations would, they would rely on the individual woman in the household uh, to convince the men in their household. And that would include sons uh, and brothers uh, and fathers. So that's uh, for, for, it opened up a door in many ways for women to persuade other women. And I think that the left doesn't, can't, doesn't have to own that, that theory because it's, it's, a, it's a true theory. Um, it's a matter of all of us realizing, and as I spoke a, a little bit ago about the idea of being confident uh, and, and deciding to be the leader in something, you're that way at home as well. So it's, it's, that's where your responsibility is with the family. And uh, that door now was unlocked for women uh, to play that role uh, with the people in their lives. Yeah, that's great. And I find it, that made me think while you were talking, I've never heard it put that way before. That was really interesting. And I find it really fascinating that a lot of the social movements um, and protest movements, both on the left and right, that we see are led by women and women are the most vocal. They're the ones like protesting, you know, the, they're the most vocal faces of movements and yet the representation of women in government is really you know abysmal i think 20 percent of congress is well you know women have like to that. decide it, it is yeah. i was I, I remain an activist being an activist uh on your own volition being in your community uh you're standing up for something we do that as moms we do that as mama bears we we defend our families running for office is a very different ball of wax uh, there are systems in place that keep incumbents being comfortable, including money, uh, a lack of, uh, of term limits I'm a very big fan of, to let new blood come in, systems uh, that are not uh, sympathetic to women running and don't encourage them. Uh, it's about also recruiting women. We have saw finally the GOP doing a pretty decent job of that last time around, making a particular point of, of it's like affirmative action. Affirmative action is not a guarantee that of an outcome. Affirmative action is actually the outreach at like a billboard uh, featuring women police officers saying, yes, be a cop, right? That's affirmative action to remind women that, wait a minute, I can join the military. I can be a police officer. I can run for office. I, I can you know, whether it's, or, or, you know, we know it traditionally, well, you can be a teacher or you can do this, that, or the other thing. Affirmative action is reaching out and saying, this is for you as well. And that is what the parties 
the Democratic Party has done a very good job of that. The Republican Party continues to need to step up, but women first. It's not that people haven't been voting for us. We don't run for office as often as men. We have to decide to run and that's up to us. I have a theory about that too. So it to, uh, just, I have a theory about that. My theory is that women have the children, you know, women have their babies That's and, true. and it's really, as mothers, That's true. it's really, really hard. Um, I, I said to Julia, you're right. Which I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this at all, but I said, maybe I'll run for office. And she said, my daughter, she said, you're too old. I'm like, what do you mean I'm too old? You know, <laughs> it's like, no way. <laughs> But maybe now is the time, but that's a very good point. Our lives, we make decisions that best suit us and that's perfectly fine. I'm not saying uh -huh. we, you know, we should have parity demanded. This is a reminder, uh, you know, Tova for everybody here that our lives are in our hands, that our lives are different indeed uh, and arguably sometimes better and that it should be open for those who do wanna run. But it, I think it's less of a statement uh, regarding regarding numbers about fairness. Uh, and I, I was speaking at Smith College once and they were complaining that there was never a woman who was the head of the World Bank or you know international um, uh, banking and the economy. Where are the women? And I said to them, I said, well, how many of you are majoring in poetry? And of course, this was Sylvia Plath's college. So a lot of, half of the hands went up. I said, how many of you are majoring in economics? No hands, because they don't even have at Smith, at least when I spoke there, an economics department. They didn't have a business department, the college for women. And yet there they were complaining that there was, that there was no women head of the banks. It's like, well, why don't you go to a college where you can learn banking and become the head of the freaking bank? Uh, it didn't occur to them. It was always going to be someone else or it was the system's fault. Um, in some ways, yes, but but not always. It's the choices we make uh, that determine uh, the future. And we need to be fair about that. We do want to demand more. Uh, like if Janine, if you want to run for office, we, we you know, being able to make that happen uh, and for the women who don't uh, to be fine with that too. Yes. And we, we need to get to Kathy here and we have okay. a book book to give away. Um, I, I, uh, what I, I guess what, I, what I'm just saying is women have children and, and, and to run for office is a, it's a all consuming, totally. um, you know, travel all consuming. And I think yes. a lot of them have these, have, and they go, well, I'm going to raise my kids and maybe then I'll think about it later. That's why I think you see older, a lot of older women, but women can do both. Well, our generation, it, it's yeah. our generation finally coming up and out, right. Being raised feminist, yeah. Yeah. having those experiences, now, having the kids, yeah. Okay. Kathy, go for it. I'm well, thank you, Tammy. We've got so many great listener questions and comments. I want to lead with Michael Amowitz, who says that he's so glad that we have Tammy on today. We need so many more like her in media whenever possible. So we're really glad that you're with us today. Uh, Professor Klinger, adds an important point, and I was always really surprised about this. He says, women had been given suffrage in different states and places at different times before the 19th Amendment. Wyoming had given women the vote much earlier. Many states allowed women to vote in municipal and school board elections before, long before they could vote in state or federal elections. And we had another listener who also made a point that I believe in Montana, uh, Jeanette Cranach's namesake, Jeanette uh, Rankin was elected to Congress before women had the right to vote. That's right. Um, and do you have any comments on that? Or? Well, you know, that's what's great about the West and about what, uh, you know, I think the, the West uh, and, and those uh, revolutionaries are like our royalty. They did that because they, they needed people to, to move West. Mm -hmm. they, they, and this is, again, about necessity and inventiveness. It was like, well, you know, if we give women the right to vote. It was a desire to get those women and their families. This is again about the woman deciding, hey, uh, and that to drive those people to get them to become pioneers. It, it's it's a, a, a beautiful part of our history, a great reminder that that was uh, one of the uh, techniques of those who are running uh, those uh, uh, territories and then states about we want to build this up. We've got to get people out here. And that was one of those things that it reminds you about the importance of the conversation even then and about persuasion 
and and women's decision making that would have an impact on the whole family. Exactly. And uh, Dwayne Horner wrote in that in, I believe it was October of uh, 1919, President Woodrow Wilson had a stroke and was incapacitated for the rest of his presidency. And Dwayne said that it was well known that Woodrow Wilson's wife ran the White House after that until uh, President Woodrow Wilson left office and was just wondering if you had any comments on that. Again, that was before women had the right to vote. Yes, and again, it, it's, it's, we have to remember that even before having the right to vote, that the, it's, that's not the thing that gives us power. It was almost a, a result of the power that we had already and that we have each day in our personal lives, uh, that that is accurate. And it's one of the reasons why the 25th Amendment was created, was this idea that we, they needed to be able to somehow remove a president who was uh, completely incapacitated, like through a stroke, uh, who was not able to function as president. Uh, and yet, of course, um, uh, women, uh, we usually are able to deliver on whatever it is that uh, we're called upon to do. Uh, and um, uh, I think that that's a very good reminder about the power and the influence and really the, the partnership uh, of marriage uh, and um, uh, you know, how, how that empowers women and how it should empower women. Uh, and even of course, empower the men that they're with as well. Very true. Um, and I want to also read, we have a student on with us today, Isabel Cruz, who's one of our We the Future contest winners. And Isabel writes, until this year when Kamala Harris was elected vice president, women were not ever voted as president or vice president. Before now, were there some people who said this was discrimination, uh, women not being voted president or vice president? And I think that goes back to the, to the comment that you were making that women need to get out there and run. In That's right. But I just didn't know if you had any further comments. Yeah, you know, I think um, uh, always in politics, uh, there will be arguments that something is discrimination or something that to move something into a framework. Uh, and the left tends to do this, which is unfortunate, uh, that Americans don't want to do something. But, you know, the, the more when you're just dealing with a pool uh, of people or uh, numbers of something, uh, the more numbers you have, the odds are higher that more uh, people will be elected, right? So that if you if inevitably more men are going to win because more men are running um, and women do have a different, we have fewer uh, examples, fewer role models who have run in that kind of position uh, that where, where we're able to look to and say, okay, that's how we do it. We, we are always having to invent ourselves and our approach when it comes to something new. But I think that makes us stronger and even more interesting. We're, we're less inclined to get into the pits of the usual situation, especially when it comes to politics. So I, I think it certainly is, is less that we, you know, that it's discrimination, but that because we have had a few, um, but it's also Americans, we love the underdog because we're, we are the underdog. We are a romantic people. We expect new great things. We are adventurous. Sure, we're willing to go to the moon. We're willing to do, we're willing to start the country and fight the biggest power on earth, which is England and win. I mean, it's amazing what you can do when, when you are romantic and are, are excited about the future. Um, so I think that it really comes down to um, not that there was discrimination, it, it, there's an was a lack of familiarity. The argument, I think, that and the belief that women couldn't do certain things. Now, of course, we have examples and people say, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, women can do that. We, you know, we see that whenever you see a man, you've already seen a man in power. You've already seen a man as president. So the solution to that is not to bully people into voting for someone who looks a certain way or is, a, or is a woman or is a person of color, but getting more people involved, having more examples and role models uh, so that we can uh, naturally move into those positions. But it comes down to the decision about who's running, the arguments we make, and being undeniably the better candidate. We've seen that in many political cycles, women rising to the top, um, uh, unexpectedly, I'll use Nikki Haley as uh, the head of, as our ambassador to the UN. I was shocked with her performance. 
I did not expect much from her because I didn't know her much, right? I don't live in the, the Carolinas, but my goodness, she delivered. Uh, Christy Nome, who knew? And suddenly she's a star because she's delivering. Um, uh, Kamala Harris delivered in, in, uh, as in California. She has a chance to deliver as vice president. I don't know if she will, but we will find out one way or another. Now, girls have uh, role models uh, who continue to deliver, um, and uh, it's very exciting to watch. But the same rule should apply to us. We must be the better candidate. We must deliver, and, and we've, because we can, uh, as opposed to having people uh, be pressured uh, into something because of identity politics uh, or because of uh, the political arguments of another side. I, I just have to step in on that because my mother would always talk about this with acting. Um, mm. And I'll go back to you too, Kathy, because we have our book. Uh, we have to wrap up here. Yes, I know. I can't believe <laughs> I it. It's been an hour. I know, I know. It's been fascinating and wonderful. Um, my mother always taught me that it's an odds factor. So if, if I'm going to give you an example of an aud auditioning and you, you make a, so you've made so many really astute point, you know, all your uh, perceptions are so astute or anyway. Yeah. So my mother <laughs> would always tell me that it's an odds factor. I, I have to have a lot of auditions, um, like a, like a, like a, like a shoot, a lot of auditions and then I'll book one. But if I only get one audition a month, you know, my odds aren't high enough to, to roll the dice to actually to actually book a job. And so I love the point you made, but we need more women to run. I mean, if you had a stage up there of all women um, in the debates, a woman's gonna win. That's right. So it's uh, it's really, really a great point. Okay, Kathy, sorry, I just had to go in there and say that, well, so back to you. Tammy's president of an organization that I really think so highly of, Independent Women's Voice. And y'all have a couple of books. And I was just wondering, Tammy, if you want to tell us a little bit about these books. And if we have time, I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about one thing that I hear y'all say a lot at Independent Women's Voice and Independent Women's Forum, that all issues are women's issues. So I'm going to hand it back over to you one more time. Yes, and well, this has been great, and thank you very much. And I think it it's, um, uh, speaks for itself here, uh, especially you know the women who won the vote. This is a, a the, their stories are important, also within the context of what we discussed today, um, because not not I think not not one single act is ever really enough. Again, it's practicing being Americans. We practice it every day, and uh, so learning our history learning the kinds of women who did this before they had the vote, deciding we can do this, we can get this done. It was wildly imperfect, absolutely. But this is the only country on earth that allows this to occur. I know many women were arrested. There, there were marches, people chained themselves to the White House. I mean, it is, it's the American sensibility about making a difference. And so that's why I recommend the women who won the vote. And then of course, how to talk to kids uh, whether you're a teenager and you've got, you know, a little brother or a little sister, uh, kids in the neighborhood, maybe you're a substitute teacher, maybe you help out at church and you're, you're heading up something there at the church or at the temple, uh, is that the, the nature of, of how to broaden this out and talk with kids about issues like this that everyone can relate to, no matter what our age, you know, as we become conscious of, you know, uh, that you want to choose what you want to have for dinner and that this, the issue of confidence and knowing what you want and how that relates to how we deal with other people and what our futures look like and what we really can do and what we need to do to be able to realize uh, uh, the kinds of things that really appeal to us. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a pianist or an astronaut. Now I haven't become either one, um, but it is about adjustment and uh, having you know dreams. And realizing that in this country, certainly, uh, those dreams can come true. And uh, it's a very exciting th uh, time to live at this point. Well, thank you. Very well said. Thank you so much, Tammy Bruce. It was a joy and it's incredibly inspirational. Well, and thanks all to all of you. Great points. Great points. Thank you. Very um, exciting, thank you. Kathy. Thank you. Uh, and Janine, you're, you're the best. And uh, people can visit me at IWV.org. Uh, but we're all in this together. And it's a, a pleasure and an honor to be with you. Thanks, you guys. Oh, thank, thank you, Tammy. Thank you. Have a great day. And thank you to our sponsor once again, Jerry Kohler. Jerry, we really appreciate you sponsoring this episode. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.